My name is Joel. In this episode of Unplugged, I talk to Startup Bootcamp founder Patrick De Zeeuw. Patrick started his first company back in the days when he was traveling the world as a professional snowboarder. After working for a large media company, he became a successful serial entrepreneur. And in 2011, he co-founded Startup Bootcamp. Presently, Startup Bootcamp is one of the major global startup accelerators with programs in startup hubs like London, New York, Singapore, Berlin and many other cities. I know Patrick for quite some years now and know he has some interesting views on entrepreneurship. I visited Patrick at his office in Amsterdam. We talked about the things you need in order to become successful as an entrepreneur, the importance of purpose and culture, and last but not least, his own personal drive, gut feelings and playing Donkey Kong. So I went from small entrepreneur to in going into a small company that actually became a really large company, being an investor in another company, growing that company and then doing, let's say, a startup from scratch. And I did that until 2009 and then uh, sold uh, my equity in that company and then I started traveling. And I, during the, that, uh, those travels I learned for the first time about startup accelerators that were launched in the US just about one and a half, two years before, you know, around 2007, 2008. So I went to the US and, and had a look at uh, basically how, uh, how, how they operated these programs. And, and companies in those days, it was a long time ago now, but like Airbnb and Dropbox came out of these startup accelerator programs. And I was like, wow, this, you know, if I can start a company that can help other companies grow or launch many companies from within a company that I started myself. That, that's like a, a wet dream for me. And why is it? What do you like about that idea? I think there's two aspects. In the, in the, in the last days of my, um, my snowboarding years, I started training uh, a, a, a Dutch team, young people that had the ambition to go into competition. And, and I actually enjoyed those those training sessions and coaching them, I enjoyed that actually more than competing myself. It was a different kind of pressure, but the proudness from them being successful was even probably b more big than me. Eh? And so that was, so I had some, I had something there that, that I really loved to empower others and make them stronger based on everything that I learned, being successes and failures. So that was one aspect. The other aspect was, I love to, to create something out of nothing. And doing that with 10 companies a year, and actually we're doing now 250 a year, that was for me like, if, if we can create a model where we can actually do that, contribute to all those early stage founders, first time founders, and help them grow, I think for me that would be, yeah, the magical combination of what I want to do in this phase of my life. So I'm, I'm, I'm 49 now, this is uh, eight years ago, so I was in my early 40s and I thought uh, th probably in this phase of my life this would add really a lot to what I want to contribute to, I don't know, society or entrepreneurship or... So it was one of my values to give back basically to a next generation of entrepreneurs. And at the same time you're still the entrepreneur yourself. And, and, and I, was, I was creating my own startup yeah. that was helping other startups basically grow. So I think the, the mix of the two, or the three actually, that, that makes it for me still interesting now after eight years. So what do you think is your biggest asset as an entrepreneur? Why are you successful a lot of the time? Um, I think one of the, the there's a few things that I think you need as an entrepreneur. You, you need to be extremely passionate about what you do. Um, and if you're passionate about what you do, then this will infect others. Uh, being it clients, being it new team members, being it co-founders, being it... So I think that's, that's one really important thing. And then combining passion with purpose. If you're not only really passionate about it, but also are able to add purpose to it, and bring that purpose across to others that also have a certain purpose, then suddenly one and one becomes maybe not even three, but 11. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, an, let's say, energy, passion, purpose that in that domain 
that's a really important thing. I think the other thing is um, not trying to overanalyze or over-rationalize your decision-making process. If my gut feeling says at a certain moment, there's, th this feels uh, something I need to do, then I also just trust it. You know, when I, when I first heard about these accelerator programs, I was so excited. I, I knew this was the thing that I was gonna be doing the next 10 years. I couldn't even describe it, why? I, you know, I had a hard time sleeping. I was so, I, I, th this needed to happen. I couldn't even explain why. And if you, if you bring that across, then again, it affects others. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you over-rationalize things and you think things too much through, you start thinking about what the risk maybe is or what the things are that might go wrong. And I learned not to think about these things because they will go wrong. They will, but I know by now that, you know, I can deal with these things that go wrong. If you have the right people around you, if you have the right skills, if you, if you just stay put, then you can solve any problem. I know by now that almost any problem on a business sense, you know, if you get ill or whatever, obviously, then you have you know, other people hopefully taking care of you. But on the business side, I know by now, I've seen all the problems, I think, with all the startups, with all the businesses that I've done. And I know if you just take a step back and have a look at it, maybe with some fun, you will be able to solve any problem that you encounter. So no, not overanalyzing things from the beginning. I think that's really important. Um, another thing which I think has helped me a lot is making sure that you are able to gather around people around you, which relates again to first po topic, which is passion, purpose. Um, you know, building, building a company is very much about not only building a business, but also building a culture within a company. And I've learned the hard way myself, if, if you don't get the culture within a company right, your company will never fly. It will fail sooner or later. And I've, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm good at, also related to passion and purpose, is making sure that we gather the right people around our team that are aligned on the culture, on the, on the, the purpose, on the, on the passion. And we all point in the same direction. Eventually, wh whatever business you're in, it's, it's created mostly by people. Until, at least until today, you know, maybe we'll have artificial intelligence going forward, creating the businesses for us, but you know, it's still people that need to code that. So I think, you know, those, those are the main ele elements. How do you create a culture? It's my experience that the founders create the culture. Um, people that you eventually hire, you, you try to select them based on your values and, and, and the culture that you try you want to establish, rationally or uh, irrationally, but you, you try to gather people around you that are there for the same purpose. And then people start copying basically what you do. And, and that happens very fast. If I give the, if I give the, let me give you an example. We, we have at, at Startup Bootcamp in Leaps and the Talent Institute four values. One is being entrepreneurial, which means that we make decisions really fast we don't mind if people make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time, as long as you don't make the same mistake two or three times, because then, then it's not smart. Um, it means that we take risks. It means that we use facts, but also listen to our gut feeling. And we give people freedom. If I bring that to my team, saying, you know, if we don't make mistakes, that means that we're not being entrepreneurial enough. So I want you to take risk. If I start pushing that to my team or bringing that message, then well, people will start doing that. So culture is not a message on the wall, it's actually my behavior, which is eventually being either adopted uh, by the team or not. If they don't adopt it, eventually there's probably not a cultural fit. Another example is um, of the value that we have is learning desire. So what I, every week I read articles and if it's a printed article, I take it out and I put the name of the person on it that I think should read that article. Or if it's a, you know, if it's a link from a vlog then I, or blog, I just send that. Uh, or if I read a great book that I think that the whole company should read, I buy 100 books. Yeah. And I give that to everybody. And then we gamify it a little bit. Yeah, so we, to make sure that everybody sort of like reads it or understands the knowledge that is in there. So we have a competition or people need to present to each other the content and that works really well. Um, but by giving these examples, 
you see that other people also start sharing articles or you know I just we have a great young leader who's only 23 who leads our design team he started buying books for his team of six designers and I'm not saying it's because I gave that example but I'm quite sure that when he joined the company four years ago and I gave him the first book that I thought he should read he thought well that's pretty cool that Patrick tries to inspire me so I think you know again it's it's it's, it's built by the founders. Uh, the, the founders create the nurture, uh, the, create the culture, and, and they should also have the responsibility to nurse the culture um, very intensively. That means that you have to be very selective on who you bring aboard and who you don't. And especially if you're with a small team, let's say you're maybe eight to 15 people, adding one person to the team that doesn't fit to the culture will have an immediate effect. If you're 400 people, it still has a potential effect, yeah, but, but the, the effect is maybe a little bit smaller. But especially on the leadership team, I think if you, if you sometimes we, I still make the mistake in bringing the wrong leaders on board, and you see immediately how the company is responding. So then either you have to change somebody in your leadership team, or you need to make sure that the other person is coached, that he understands the, the, the values. Throughout the years, you've seen thousands of startups. So what do you think is the biggest success factor when it comes to launching a startup successfully? Uh, eventually, you know, it's, it's the people that create the business. And, you know, a, a, a great idea or a great concept or business model with a shitty team is never going to fly. Mm -hmm. A really shitty business model with, or a shitty idea with a great founding team, they will pivot and they will find their you know, their route along the way. Um, so, you know, y y you always take a bet on the founder, never on the ideas, especially in early stage, you know, concepts and business models will change before they actually uh, are able to scale up. And, you know, that, that means that there needs to be a balanced team. And that doesn't mean that they have to be all the same. No, they should be very different, I would say. Different skills, pr probably even different personalities, uh, but should be able to work really well together. So I would say the, the most important elements are team and timing. And then timing is, you know, uh, too early, too late in the market, spot on on the market. It has to, is related to product market fit, which has to do with timing. You know, does the business model fit in, you know, uh, the, the pace of where the economy is going into or the needs of customers. So I, there's two reasons why startups fail. There's either no product market fit which could be related to the business model, timing, all those things, or it's uh, team mismatch or team conflicts. Those are the two reasons that startups and even established companies, you know, they fail. Yeah. How do you look at purpose-driven entrepreneurs who have, real, uh, re have a big passion for what they do? They have a business model, you believe in the, the concept of an entrepreneur, but then they have to pivot, maybe a few times. Yeah. And the concept is, be maybe because of pragmatic reasons, not in not aligned with their purpose anymore. Yeah. Does it happen? Uh, yes, it does happen, and then and then it mostly is not it's not going to fly. It's going to die. I th I th yeah, I think if the you know the, the the hurdles that you have to take to build a successful company are quite big. Mm. You know, it's no straight line to success. There's many dips and maybe a few spikes. And if, if, if you're not totally aligned on the purpose of, or the impact that you want to create, then it's going to be um, scientific almost, right? And it's, it's, it's artificial. Yeah. Um, so w one of the questions that I always ask to founding, founder teams is why are you doing this and not something completely different? And if they cannot answer that question, why they're doing this, then I normally, I'm not, I'm not interested in learning much more. Yeah. You know, you have to be able to explain to me what drives you on what you're doing, what you're currently doing. Because you're gonna, you're gonna need to put so much effort in this mm -hmm. that if, you, if the purpose is not there or the, the, the passion is not there for that, then you're not gonna be able to put enough energy in there. And that has to come from the core it of their being. It has to come from the, from the gut, basically, yeah. How do you make sure you stay in your own energy or your life is balanced enough to do what you want to do? By taking breaks. Yeah, we were just before the interview start talking a little bit about that. What I've also learned is that 
uh, you need to be able to take a step back sometimes from the business um, to ease your mind, uh, to be maybe, maybe less on the execution side and more on the creative side, thinking things a little bit more true. So what I've learned and have a clear agreement on with my business partners and co-founders is that I take many holidays. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to be an entrepreneur that I can decide myself when I take breaks. Um, and, and it's not about the length of the breaks, but it is, you know, even if it's only two days or three days or a week or five weeks, it doesn't matter. In, when I'm away, I'm away. I, you know, I don't like to be called about business. I don't like to be texted. I don't do any email. Um, I'm really away. I lock off completely. And it takes two, three days to get into that state of mind. Uh, but after two, three days, you know, uh, 10 years ago, it took me two weeks uh, to lock off. So it doesn't work if you're only away for three days. But by now I can do this basically in, I wouldn't say 24 hours, but in 48 hours, I'm completely. Uh, How come you, you're better at it nowadays than a few years ago? Uh, because I have less difficulty in letting loose because I, I get a team around me uh, that is way better at certain things than I am and I trust them completely. And, and if you don't have a team like that, then people will still call you, right? So I made the agreement with, with my business partner that we started started Bootcamp with Inuleeps and the Talent Institute that from the beginning that if he's away, I take care of all the business. If I'm away, he takes care of it. But then still, you know, you can do that when you have five or 10 people working for you. But if you have 400 people working for you, then that becomes a little bit more difficult. But now we got, you know, uh, quite a few very senior people around us that basically, uh, basically they call. And I have no problem in letting go. So it, it does take time to get to where you are or where we are today. But I've realized that not only for myself, but also for my family and also for the business, it's important that I'm not always there. So what happens when you're not there, when you look, look at your business or the insights you're having? Why does it help? Well, there's, there's a few things that are important, I think, which I've st I'm starting to realize more and more now in our business. Is that the business grows when I'm not there, which is great. I mean, that gives me the best feeling in the world, that things just happen without me even knowing that, you know, they are supposed to happen. So that's, that's great. The second thing is that I do a lot of reading. Um, and it's hard to read when your mind is not at ease. And uh, as we discussed, it's, it's mostly not novels or crimes. Sometimes it's a crime book, but it's mostly about business. And I love that because it gives me knowledge. And I think, you know, it's, it's great to learn from others that wrote that down in books. Um, so the insights that I get uh, when I have the ease of mind to, to read, uh, I think are very valuable, not only for me, but also for the company. So what does happen if I come back from a break is that I got a full list of, at least I think, great new insights or ideas or which I don't want to put in motion. Um, obviously not all uh, the things on the list um, have an immediate effect. And some I save for maybe three months later or six months later when, when the momentum is there. But it, I think it's important to do that, to take a distance because you, you look at it from a less, um, with less focus on the execution side and more on the strategic side. Where do we want to go in, you know, in, uh, in the next 12 to 18 months? Uh, each year, me and my business partners take a week um, off. Well, it's not, it's not, we work actually very hard, but we, we, we leave the office for a week, uh, seven days. And the first day off that, that say, business break, um, we spend on looking backwards, what went wrong, what went well last uh, year last 12 months, and the next six days we look forward. What do we need to do next year? And who's gonna take the lead on that? And we've been doing this now for five years, and this is, this is just great, looking at it from a distance. Sometimes we bring in a facilitator that challenges us or gives us new insights on how to organize ourselves maybe in a more effective way. And you know, th those weeks are extremely valuable, I must say. And that's also taking a step out of the business. It's, it's like working in your business or on your business, right? Yeah. You have a background in the gaming industry. If you look at your life as a game, what is the game you are playing? Um, it's, it's, it's basically uh, Donkey Kong, you know? Uh, trying to go one level up each time. Um, and, and, and having each level a, a more difficult challenge. 
Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's one of the games that I played when, you know, or I know that was one of the games, yeah, we were from the same, uh, same time period. Uh, you know, you always needed to go and, and beat the monkey, the big monkey on top, and then it became more difficult the next level. I think this is, this is, this is the game that we're playing. We're, we're, we're trying to get uh, each two, three years uh, a level up. And so you're you challenging yourself all yeah, the time. Yeah, that is what that's, you do. That's what I love. You know, I, lo I, I just love to improve myself also all the time and, and, and hopefully become a little bit smarter based on the mistakes that we made in level one or level two or level three. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and sometimes you get the, uh, the, uh, the barrel on your hat like the, the big donkey uh, does in, in, in Donkey Kong. But again, that, you know, from those mistakes you basically learn and you try to take them to the next level. But it's a never-ending game, so you can always have the thrill of developing yourself and learning so, more. I don't think I will, you know, un, un, uh, although you know, you might at a certain moment physically or mentally not be able to do it anymore. But I don't see myself stopping what I love to do best, which is to create something from zero to one. It could be that one day it's in a completely different environment or different bi business line than it is today. I'm not saying. That it, that it will always be the same, but uh, you know, I, I, I found my purpose in life, which is to create things out of nothing.